Welcome, dear readers. You are listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We are coming to you from a baseball field that we like to call the Carol Shields Auditorium, which is located in the geodesic dome known as the Millennium Library. We are, of course, located on Treaty 1 territory and on land that is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. In this episode, we will discuss Slaughterhouse-Five, or The Children's Crusade, by Kurt Vonnegut. If there is a book that you think we should discuss in the future, let us know at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca. I'm Alan Chorney, and as far as I can tell, I'm experiencing time linearly, and to my right is... I am Trevor. I'm the branch head of the Louis Riel Library, and in true Trafalgarian fashion, I am also a page at the old Centennial Library at the very same time. <laughs> and to my right is... Hi, I'm Dennis. I work in the Idea Mill, and I was just recently captured and taken to a zoo by a bunch of aliens, but I'm back now and feeling great. <laughs> and to my right is... Hi, I'm Erica Ball. I'm the uh, branch head librarian at the Fort Gary Library, and I was going to claim to be abducted by, <laughs> by uh, child Midorians, so... Maybe you're both in the same uh, exhibit. Maybe we are. But at different times. But at different times. That's it. A good book can carry me away from an ever-engined ordinary day, yeah. So keep it down, leave me alone, close the doors and turn off the phone, cause all I ever really need is a little more time to read. And you, dear readers, we couldn't do this without you. It's your questions and comments that form the heart of our discussions. So make us laugh or make us cry by emailing us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca or leave a comment on our website, wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. Find out if your comments made it on the air by subscribing to Time to Read on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, or other fine podcasting services. In a moment, Dennis will start us off by giving us a brief bio of Kurt Vonnegut, followed by Erica, who will spoil everything with a brief synopsis. Then it's on to the discussions which you can get in on by emailing us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca or finding us on Facebook. Don't forget to stick around to the end for our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. Dennis, carry on. Okay. This biography is based on a few sources, including the Vonnegut Library website, Wikipedia, Britannica, and Mental Floss magazine. So Kurt Vonnegut Jr. was born November 11th, 1922 in Indianapolis, Indiana. His father, Kurt Sr., was a prominent architect, and his mother, Edith, was the daughter of a wealthy brewer, and Kurt Jr. was the youngest of three siblings. The family was well off until the Depression dramatically changed their fortunes, which caused Kurt Jr. to be pulled from private school and his family to sell their home. His father apparently gave up on life, and his mother became addicted to alcohol and prescription drugs. Kurt Jr. wrote for the student paper in both high school and at Cornell, where he was the paper's managing editor. He studied chemistry, but later confessed he was a lousy student, and since he was flunking his classes anyways, he dropped out and enlisted in the army to fight in World War II. In 1944, when Vonnegut came home from military training to celebrate Mother's Day, he found his mother dead after she committed suicide by overdosing on sleeping pills. The 21-year-old Vonnegut soon went to Germany to fight in World War II, where he was captured by the Germans during the Battle of the Bulge and brought to Dresden as a prisoner of war. After the war, he married Jane Cox, who he had first met in kindergarten. They had three kids. He worked as a reporter, a public relations writer, a manager at a car dealership, and an English teacher. And he began publishing short stories in the 50s on the side. They often involved technology, which caused some critics to label his writing as science fiction, a label he rejected. His first novel, Player Piano, was published in 1952, but he mostly continued writing short stories. Then his beloved sister, Alice Adams, died of cancer in 1957, just two days after her husband had been killed in a freak commuter train crash. So Kurt and Jane took in three of Alice's children, doubling the size of their family overnight. The short story market started to crash soon after, so Vonnegut switched to publishing novels. And he had marginal success, mostly, until he published Slaughterhouse-Five in 1969, which broke through into the mainstream and made him famous. After his kids grew up, his marriage to Jane fell apart, and he became withdrawn and depressed suffered writer's block. His son Mark had a bipolar disorder breakdown, but survived. He married photographer Jill Kremens in 1979 and had a career resurgence in the 80s with several new satiric novels. He continued to struggle with depression and attempted suicide in 1984. His last published novel was Timequake in 1997, but he continued writing nonfiction essays. He often spoke out for the preservation of constitutional freedoms, for nuclear arms control, and the protection of Earth's fragile biosphere, 
and decried the militarization of the U.S. after the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. Kurt Vonnegut died on April 11, 2007, after injuries sustained from a fall on the steps of his home in New York. He was 84. So it goes. So it goes. What a guy. I mean, what do you say about Slaughterhouse-Five? It's amazingly contemporary-seeming in structure and style, with the exception of some things like the mention of microfilm. It could have been written this year. So I'm going to uh, read just an adaptation of the publisher summary, which rarely does not feel um, overhyped, but here I don't think you can overhype. So Slaughterhouse-Five is one of the world's great anti-war books. Centering on the infamous World War II firebombing of Dresden, the novel is the result of what Vonnegut described as a 23-year struggle to write a book about what he had witnessed as an American prisoner of war. It combines historical fiction, science fiction, autobiography, and satire in an account of the life of Billy Pilgrim, a barber's son turned draftee, turned optometrist, turned alien abductee. An instant bestseller when it was published, Slaughterhouse-Five's political edginess, genre-bending inventiveness, frank violence, and transgressive wit have inspired generations of readers not just to look differently at the world around them, but to find the confidence to say something about it. Fifty years now, after its initial publication, at the height of the Vietnam War, Vonnegut's portrayal of political disillusionment, PTSD, and post-war anxiety feel as relevant, darkly humorous, and profoundly affecting as ever. Darkly humorous, indeed. Indeed. I'm curious to know what everyone's, how people perceived Slaughterhouse Five previous to this podcast. Like, did everyone have experience with the book? Is this people's first time reading it? For me, I had read it about ten years ago, mm-hmm. and it was the the first uh, Kurt Vonnegut book I I ever read. So mm-hmm. I think it was recommended to me by a friend after they said, "Oh, you've never read Kurt Vonnegut," and then I kind of felt like, "Oh, maybe I should have." <laughs> and so this was a reread for me. Mm-hmm. I very different experiences for me mm-hmm. having read it ten years ago versus having read it this past month. So uh, we can get mm-hmm. into that, but that's my history with the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I first read it in uh, high school. It wasn't assigned. I was just like, this is something cool that I should probably read. I did not get it. I think I must have been like 15, 16. So this time when I read it, it like hit me like a knife in the chest. And yeah, very, very different experience. Did you know that it was uh, on high school curriculums in the United States when you read it in high school? I think I was just trying to read things that are like the things people talked about. Yeah. Right? Being the things to read. No, I didn't look at other high school <laughs> curricula. <laughs> Which I did, if you missed the CTV plug of this book. Um, my first experience with this is in high school, I was looking at other curriculums in the United States and Slaughterhouse-Five was on a lot of them. And I just also like to apologize for throwing the Canadian curriculum under the bus <laughs> on television. Uh, it was a very fine <laughs> curriculum. I loved Flowers for Algernon. <laughs> <laughs> But Dennis, you were a huge fan of Kurt Vonnegut. This was Dennis's pick, wasn't it? Well, I had suggested it because of the 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. But I think it was 20 some years ago, I was trying to improve my reader's advisory skill. So I was going through a list of greatest books of the century and uh, Slaughterhouse-Five was one of them. I read it at a particular point in my life where I had gone through a fairly deep depression for much of my early life. And I was coming out of it, not thanks to any seeking any treatment. If you're depressed, go seek treatment. Yeah. <laughs> it's really helpful. But I, I was coming out of it due to some changes in my life. And then I read Slaughterhouse-Five. And it was the first time I had ever read anything by an author who obviously was depressed, who understood depression deeply, conveyed it throughout the novel, but left pieces of hope. Mm-hmm. Subtle, but... It was always there, and uh, it really grabbed me. And I ended up reading a bunch of his other novels, and that was that's a theme (laughs) (laughs) through through his work. um, So yeah, so this time rereading it, it wasn't as impactful as it had been back then. It was more like a memory of these experiences, and I I found it very helpful at the time, kind of processing my emotions. As as someone who really liked Kurt Vonnegut and has read a lot of his work, do you feel that this book stands out from his other works or is similar to his other works? Or I feel like he had been developing his voice in the novels leading up to it. And actually, my favorite of his novels is Sirens of Titan. But it's a standout work, I think. Well, it's obviously a standout work because of the impact it had on society. Uh, but I do actually like others, uh, other of his books better. Like I've reread Sirens of Titan like three or four times and uh, Cat's Cradle twice, I think, and some of the others. But 
So this isn't one I've reread except for this podcast. Mm. I think this is like the first time we've all read the book before discussing mm-hmm. it. I interestingly, think, I think so. Yeah. yeah. So we're all coming to it a second time. Yeah. And I'm not sure if this is true for all of us, but was this the first Kurt Vonnegut book we all read? Yes. 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 Yeah. And, yeah. I, and it sounds similar too that we've all it had a certain impact on us that I'm not sure if it's true for all of us, but we it led us to read other Kurt Vonnegut books. I know that was the case for me. I don't know, mm-hmm. Erica, if that's. Or this is the only one. I hadn't because yeah. I didn't get it, but right. I will now. Yeah. No, just because the reason I say that is because yeah. I, I think of him as sort of in the group of authors where you almost have to talk about his body of work mm-hmm. almost more than just individual novels because it mm-hmm. seems like he's he's the type of artist that was developing his ideas, like you say, up to a point and then not sort of, I, I was going to say rehash, but that sounds negative. I meant like revisit the themes over again mm-hmm. from different perspectives, uh, modern life, alienation, depression, all these things uh, in books like uh, Cat's Cradle or uh, God Bless You, uh, mm-hmm. Mr. Yeah, Rosewater, Rosewater and these other ones. So it's interesting to, when you asked Dennis about the other books. I was thinking the same thing. Like we, It's almost like this episode is like Kurt Vonnegut and Slaughterhouse Five together. Yeah. Like, you know, we're not just going to discuss the plot points of this book, mm-hmm. but almost uh, his whole way of what, what he was all about. Because well, he invented like a new form of writing, like it was like a new form of novel. Mm-hmm. What were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say even some of the characters appear in, in different uh, novels as well. Like Kilgore Trout appears in, in other novels and Elliot Rosewater is in other novels as well. Yes, but they are never consistent. Mm-hmm. Like the Tralfamadorians appear in multiple novels, but they are entirely different in every single novel mm-hmm. in which they appear. Like in, Wait, which is kind of funny because they're in this novel, they exist and they always exist and they always exist in the same way throughout time, which is mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. Uh, the Tralfamadorians and the other sci-fi trappings of his work is one of the reasons he got labeled sci-fi by a, a number of critics. But the thing is, I argue strongly against that because he never attempts to make anything scientific or consistent or have a, a an underlying rationale for why anything would work. Right? Mm-hmm. They're just trappings. And if he had called them elves or angels or something else like that, they would have the same impact on the story, except he didn't do that. You know, he chose a specific thing, but it's not sci-fi. <laughs> it's more like magical realism, if anything. Like kind it's like of. there's touches of an otherworldliness going on but it could be all within somebody's brain, for example. Yeah. See, that's the thing about this novel in particular. Like, you're following Billy P- Pilgrim and he's unstuck in time. Mm-hmm. But the whole thing could just be the post-traumatic stress and a, and a break with reality. Mm-hmm. And there's no one to say different, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we talk a lot about unreliable narrators and Billy Pilgrim is an entirely unreliable <laughs> narrator. <laughs> well, it's because the, well, the narrator is really Kurt Vonnegut. Yes. As true. somebody who knew Billy Pilgrim, but it's never really, it's never outlined how he knows that Billy Pilgrim went through these things or any of these things that he's writing about. He just. It, yeah. It's very interesting how like the first book. and the last chapter are written like in the first person where like Kurt Vonnegut is talking directly or the mm-hmm. character of Kurt Vonnegut, who knows, like it's yeah. layers and layers is talking. And, and that's why I drew me in the first time was like, I was utterly charmed by him in the yeah. first chapter, just the way he was almost just leveling with the reader and saying, mm-hmm you have no idea how hard it was for me to write this book yeah. and uh, how much it cost me. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and almost, it was almost like a forward to a book, but it was mm-hmm. the first chapter mm-hmm. and then it switches into a more uh, third person narrative with mm-hmm. about Billy Pilgrim. And then it goes back though at the end as yeah. if, and then there are a couple of times aren't there in the book where he identifies himself. He goes, that's me. That's yeah. I, I'm the author. That's the, you yeah. know, when yeah. in, in Dresden, I said that, I yeah. said that. that was yeah. me, you know, yeah. I, I was in the, the, the slaughterhouse with him or I was, yeah. you know, well, when they were sent out afterwards after the bombings to burn the bodies or dig out the bodies, he was, he was part of that. So again, it was funny too, the, the way you did that, because it's like you're reading along and you're in the flow of the story and he just sort of slaps you in the face it a does. little bit with yeah. the, that was me, the yeah. author, <laughs> like me, yeah. <laughs> Not the character. <laughs> Can you do that? <laughs> Can you yeah. write that in a book? <laughs> when he, he's Break the that. fourth wall, right? It, 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 like, it's, yeah. like in the, it's like in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Every once in a while it cuts to the, the criminologist, you know, mm-hmm. and, and he's explaining things and then it cuts back to the story. It's like, you know, I can yeah. imagine Kurt Vonnegut sitting in his office, you know, and he's like, yeah, that's me, right? Okay, back to the story, you know, Dresden. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think I think the interesting thing about reading this book in high school was that 
at that point, you haven't read enough novels in your life to know what novels are, to know how groundbreaking a novel like this is. You're just like, all all novels must be like this, or all novels have the potential to be this good. And you don't realize what an influence that that yeah. uh, that he's had on literature. You know, that's the thing about everything you read in high school, mm-hmm. though. It's like, I remember Of Mice and Men and really liking it mm-hmm. and all. But there were a lot of novels that we were forced to read. Mm-hmm. And it, because we were forced to read them, it's like, ah, this mm-hmm. sucks. Mm-hmm. Because of the natural teenage urge to reject whatever is just ha- forced on you. Yes. But those were really good books. <laughs> they, mm-hmm. Yeah. They were they're picked for they're a reason. Wasted, but yeah. they're wasted on high schoolers, yeah. I feel. I, I don't know if... But are they wasted or are they laying the I foundation? I feel like we've had this conversation I think, I before. Think we have to, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was talking about you know, my English teacher, how he got frustrated one day. He's like, ah, I don't know why I'm bothering with you kids. Go out and live life for 20 years and then come back. And then we'll yes. discuss these things. You yeah. know, it's a similar idea. Because you can't tell somebody yeah. something. Yeah. Like you can't, like there's certain things you, you can't just tell them are true yeah. but and I feel, have them get it. But I feel like it's handy to have someone tell you that and you not get it. And then once you do get it, you're like, oh, that's now what I get they were it? trying to tell me. <laughs> I, I, I feel like that's a useful thing. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw, that, uh, throw that under the bus. <laughs> it, it also shows something when an author can break through that kind of cynicism that mm-hmm. you have in high school when you're mm-hmm. being forced to read these books and you actually appreciate them mm-hmm. at that level. And I feel like Vonnegut is there, right? Like he tosses things out that younger people can grab onto mm-hmm. and think, yeah, that, I get that. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Even if they don't get all of it. I, I would be I would be curious to know if that's true, because none of us were forced to read this in high school. That's mm-hmm. true. Um, but I, did anyone read Catcher in the Rye in high school? Yeah, I like Catcher in the Rye. I read it in high school, but not. I wasn't forced to read in high school. I was, yeah. kind of, I was the, it was okay. the uh, Slaughterhouse mm-hmm. Five for me where I, I picked it up. Yeah. Because I, similar idea. It's like, you know, when you hear about the top, you know, novels of the 20th century and, yeah. and we yeah, have my two experiences of reading it 10 years ago and then reading it recently were so different because mm-hmm. I had heard about this novel years and years before I ever mm-hmm. picked it up and I knew it was considered in the Pantheon. And, and so when I read through it, it, I, it didn't meet my expectations of being sort of like this grand life changing novel. I got through it and I was like, oh, Oh, okay. You know, and, mm-hmm. uh, and, but this time when I was reading it, I was much more careful in my reading mm-hmm. and I just felt like, okay, maybe I just went way too fast the first time. Mm-hmm. And, and kind of like what you were saying, Erica, about high school, maybe not getting it. Like, maybe I don't think I, I don't think I got what was going on the first mm-hmm. time. And then reading it again, I was like, I don't want to have that same experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I read it slower. I, I got the, the sense of the story, the nonlinearness and how like the climax happens almost mm-hmm. off page like mm-hmm. where his war buddy gets caught for stealing the uh, teapot mm-hmm. and is tried and is executed and but that's just almost like you find that out in the first chapter I think or the fr- mm-hmm. very very early and then yeah. and then it just peters out and then the rest of, it's like he took the story and dropped it on the pavement mm-hmm. grabbed it and then put, didn't put it back in any particular order that he cared to and then said well that's okay this is it i couldn't do it because i'm 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 processing my mm-hmm. you know my my war experience mm-hmm. and i need to tell people about this but mm-hmm. at the same time like i can't tell people about this so this is what yeah. i've got it's it's useless yeah. it's like when you said in the beginning he talks about is it a lot turning back and looking in the Bible and Lot's, his, wife. Lot's wife turns yeah. into a pillar of salt. And yeah. He goes, well, this book was written by a pillar of salt because yeah. he looked back and this yeah. is all I could do, you know, yeah. and he's apologizing for it in a way. It's like, I wish I could write something better about the bombing of Dresden, but yeah. this is what I got. He lays out his thesis statement in the beginning of the book in a way. So it's, he's talking about something else, but it's about the book too. It is so short and jumbled and jangled because there's nothing intelligent to say about a massacre. Hmm. Everybody's hmm. supposed to be dead to never say anything or want anything ever again. Everything is supposed to be very quiet after a massacre, and it always is, except for the birds. And what do the birds say? All there is to say about a massacre. Things like, poo wheat There's also the point in the book when he's been kidnapped by the Tranfamladorians, and they're taking him away, and they've only got the one book for him to read, and he's read it. And he's like, well, do you have anything else? Well, we have our own novels, but you wouldn't understand them. Well, give it to me anyways. And it's like... So what is this? It's like, well, it's just a series of descriptions of incidents, but we read them all at once. But they're carefully selected to give you a feeling, a sense of something. And I think that was him saying, this is what this book is, too. Mm -hmm. It's a whole bunch of stuff. And when you look at the whole thing, you get a feeling 
inside you, and that's what this is. Uh, yeah, I, th I think this is a big theme in the book is explaining what the book is, because I have another section here, too. Um, so Mary O'Hare is saying, you'll pretend you were men instead of babies, and you'll be played in the movies, movies by Frank Sinatra and John Wayne, or some of those other glamorous, war-loving, dirty old men. And the narrator replies a few paragraphs later, if I ever do finish it, though, I give you my word of honor, there won't be a part for Frank Sinatra or John Wayne. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about the name of the main character, Billy Pilgrim, is kind of the antithesis of John Wayne, because John Wayne's always calling people pilgrim in his mm -hmm. movies. Mm. Mm. I never made that connection. <laughs> I didn't the first time I read it, and then I read it this time, and I, and I don't even know why I, I know that John Wayne calls people <laughs> pilgrim all the time. I just It's one of those things you, you pick up, because I haven't really watched a lot of John Wayne movies. Um, but if you go on YouTube, there's like a super cut of every time <laughs> John Wayne <laughs> calls someone pilgrim. Well, and every time someone does an <laughs> imitation of him, they always say that. that, that you're right, you're right, that's true. Yeah. Well, pilgrim... <laughs> <laughs> my my only John Wayne story is that about I don't know twenty years ago my my mom wanted this table refinished so th we took it to a place out near Birds Hill uh, this woman did it from her home and so <laughs> when my mom was dealing with the woman that was doing the refinishing I was left in the living room with her husband mm -hmm. and I happened to look up and on one wall was like it must have been I'm not even exaggerating thirty like of those Franklin Mint uh, plates and every one of them was John Wayne. <laughs> and, and, and so we're sitting there in this tiny little, you know, living room couch. And I just said, so you, you, you like John Wayne? <laughs> and like this long pause. And he's like, well, my wife thinks I do. <laughs> oh, no. And he, just now, now you know more about him than his wife does. <laughs> Oh. I said I liked a John Wayne movie once 50 years yeah, ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was just surprised that Franklin Mint would have produced 30 different versions. Like they were all different. They weren't, yeah. you know, yeah. one when he's on a horse and one he's just kind of, yeah. So what do you guys think of Billy Pilgrim as a character? I think he's hilarious and adorable. I'm going to say he's tragic. Yeah. Would be the way I would poor, describe poor him. Poor Billy. <laughs> I could only describe him as Vonnegutian in the sense that every one of Vonnegut's protagonists is not the same as Billy Pilgrim, but no matter what the story is, they are dragged along by it hmm. and unable to fight against the forces of whatever it is that's propelling them. But they maintain their kindness generally, hmm. Hmm. which is one of the startling things about Billy is like, given all the crap he went through <laughs> and all the trauma, he's still extremely kind all the time. Hmm. Beg your pardon. Oh, I'm sorry. Beg your pardon. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny when you say all the crap you went through because they described the uh, Tralfamor, Tralf, uh, Tralfamador Tralfamadors as looking like uh, plungers. Yeah. And, plung and plungers is clear crap. Yeah. <laughs> so I almost feel like maybe as part of his uh, I don't know, healing journey or whatever, this, if, if he in fact is imagining these aliens, uh, maybe it's part of his getting over the, his, his war experience by being, going to a place where Instead of being locked in a slaughterhouse, he's hanging out with a, a extremely attractive porn star, uh, and oh, is oh. able to, uh, ha, you know, uh, start a family. I guess mm -hmm. it's the weirdest situation. I mean, as far mm -hmm. as black and white between mm -hmm. what he was experiencing in, in the basements of Dresden to mm -hmm. yeah. the zoo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although apparently he had a very happy marriage, right? So, like his wife loved him dearly. He seemed to love her. Yeah. It, it, Valencia, are you saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I forgot yeah. his name right now. But, yeah. but then she, she went, no, but, but wasn't he describing her as being like he, ugly? He, and yeah. like he just married her. He didn't feel like he, he wanted he to. He wanted to not marry her, he, I think, her originally. Well, yeah. but when she was, uh, when they were talking, he said he had already seen the future and mm -hmm. he knew that they stayed together and were happy together mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and were still nice to each other. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, Billy is also the kind of character who he never really displays any particular passions, mm. aside from when he wants to go and tell people about the aliens. W mm. Yeah, which is why, which is why, to me, his marriage was happy enough, but it was wasn't. I think the marriage that maybe he wanted. Well, for for Billy, happy enough is a really big deal. <laughs> yeah, you know, like yeah. he gets he gets pulled along in all this garbage, and all he wants is for something to to be bearable. Yes, and it and it actually is. he doesn't. He doesn't even want that, though. Like uh, when his dad threw him into the swimming pool when he was a kid to teach mm -hmm. him, you know, sink or swim. Mm -hmm. And he woke up on the bottom. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. He dimly sensed that someone was rescuing him. Billy resented that. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the, the spot later where, you know, he has the framed prayer on his wall, the, like the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to, to accept the things mm-hmm. I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference. Among the things Billy Pilgrim could not change were the past, the present, and the future. Yeah. <laughs> Which is yeah. Like, okay. He's just sort of like, whatever. I'll have- propose to this girl. It's nice. Yeah. And that's, I know yeah. when I'm going to die. Yeah. It's going to happen. I just have to wait till then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and that sort of does seem like a recurring theme in some of his other books to write the uh, whether we have free will or not that whole issue and, mm-hmm. and how the traf um, I'm just going to the alien race. Like, <laughs> yeah. the, you know, the, they've never had free will, right? They don't understand yeah. it. And, and not only do they didn't, no one in the universe does or thinks they do except for the Earth. And the, mm-hmm. they, the Earthlings are an interesting mm-hmm. group. They're the only ones that we've ever met that they actually think that they mm-hmm. have any kind of control over the yeah, It's almost because of the free will that they're kind of delusional. It's a delusional thing yeah. on, of, of the human race is, mm-hmm. is that they think they have free will. Yeah, and the whole concept that they know how the universe ends, mm-hmm. that they caused it, <laughs> but they can't change it. I mean, yeah. they know what they know who presses the button and what yeah. it does, and they're like, eh. It's already you know. happened. Yeah, it's, it's, happened. The, the it's happening order, right now. Right? Yeah. Ho- hopefully we don't take that view on climate change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. we we still believe in free will, so. Do we? Do we? Do we? Don't that, we? That's a, that's a question we've asked. Do we believe in free will? And I guess I, I, I wouldn't say I don't believe in free will, but I think it's a trickier question than to just say, of course, I have free will. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think any, everything is like predetermined necessarily. I don't think that's a requirement of there not being free will, that there is a plan in place for everything. But I don't know that free will is necessarily a thing. Because mm-hmm. there's always millions of factors and biases at play and all kinds of like yeah, subconscious things going there's things on things leading and, up to your thought like where yeah. your thoughts come from right yeah. you don't think your thoughts your thoughts appear which is a tricky question to to grapple with yeah mm-hmm. when i started thinking about the question of free will uh, maybe uh, i don't get all like first year sociology on you but <laughs> mm-hmm. i thought of maslow's hierarchy of needs mm-hmm. oh, and yeah. for this little you know uh for those that don't know abraham maslow came up with this idea or Maslow, I don't know how you pronounce Maslow, it. Maslow, yeah. Maslow, thank yeah. you very much. So the very base need is like physiological needs like food and safety or not even safety, just like food and water. And so mm-hmm. if, when you can get that, then it's the safety needs. And then only then is it stuff like love and belonging, self-esteem and the highest one, self-actualization. Mm-hmm. You know, it sounds very new agey. And I mean, there's been lots of examples showing that this model is not, does not reflect reality, but mm-hmm. it kind of got the idea that in order to have free will, you almost have to satisfy these other needs first. Like if all you're doing is trying not to get killed uh, Mm -hmm. or something, then no, you're going to do the thing that you need to do to survive. And then it's Mm -hmm. only when you have some sort of level of stability in your life, then yeah, maybe you can pursue a hobby or or something. Make some decisions. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. you know, maybe that's where the free, and maybe that's why humans feel like they have free will because we've, I don't know, evolved to the point where we do have that stability. Like if we were like, I don't know, a caribou, you know, a, a caribou may not think he, ha- he or she has free will because, uh, you know, they're just trying to get by. They're just trying to get against <laughs> me up there, by. right? Trying, trying to not get eaten by a pack of wolves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. So that, that's all I'm going to say about Abraham Maslow. Love? Love? Maslow. Oh, Lord. Maslow. 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 Why am I making it harder than it, it is? <laughs> Maslow. <laughs> nice and slow. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Winnipeg Public Library, how can I help you? Hi. Uh, this may be a weird question. Uh, how do you find good books to read? Well, if you let me know the kind of things you've enjoyed in the past, I can try to make some suggestions for you. Or I can suggest some resources that can help you find interesting books if you prefer looking on your own. Maybe that second one. See, I'm actually trying to find good books for my mom. She can't get out to the library herself anymore, so I wanted to get some for her. But we don't read the same things. She has eclectic tastes. And I'm not sure how to even start looking. In that case, I'll recommend you try the Novelist Plus database. Novelist Plus? Yes. Go to our website, winnipeg.ca slash library, and click on the databases button. Scroll down to Novelist Plus and click on it, then enter your library card information. Once you're in, you can search through genres, recommended reading lists, or even just type in a description of something you'd like to read, and Novelist Plus will show you suggestions. It's a great way to find some new fiction or nonfiction. So if I wanted to find... Say, vampire stories set in a steampunk universe. Novelist Plus could help me with that? 
Uh, well, yeah, actually. Fantastic. I'll give it a try. Thanks. Have a great day. Do we have any Instagram? We do have from Instagram that com- for, from that one, the free yeah, will one. Yeah. One, no, um, no. Nobody had things to say about free will. About free will, no. They didn't have a choice about <laughs> saying it. Either, <laughs> just, it was never going to happen. I guess. <laughs> We did get some Instagram replies for our So It Goes question, uh, which is mentioned after any death in the book. And we asked, what do you think it means? And GMC Davis said, people die. That's what happens. Either there's no great truth beyond that biological reality, or there is, but it's beyond our capacity to understand. In the first chapter of Slaughterhouse-Five, Vonnegut, a veteran of World War II, describes his ultimately doomed attempt to write the ultimate novel that would encapsulate and make sense of the war. There is no sense to be made of the wholesale slaughter. So what's the point of death? What's the greater meaning of the mass of violence human beings are capable of inflicting on one another? That's just what happens. So it goes. Yeah. Which is a heavy comment. That's a heavy comment. My take on it was that the first instance, I think it was the first one where he says, so it goes, like first he says, and so on and so on a lot. But then after he says, so it goes about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and how even though we are told that those were vile people in quotation marks, we still look back at those things. And Vonnegut spends this, positions himself as Lot's wife looking back even though she was told not to and was turned into a pillar of salt. So I think So It Goes is is a little bit of him. It's sort of like a, a remembrance in a way mm-hmm. and like a less like, you know, hopefully a lessons learned kind of thing about the destruction of Dresden and all these and what it means and where it came from and and how that is the same as any as any death, really, if that makes sense. I kind of felt like it was his version of Amen in that, you know, you say it, it's solemn. Mm-hmm. It's an acknowledgement that this happened, but also that it's going to happen. I mean, even if you didn't yeah. die in war, you would eventually die. If you didn't die in some ridiculous way, you would die in some dull way, but you will die. So it goes. Mm-hmm. We acknowledge it and we just have to keep moving on anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sin, I was going to bring in the other Instagram comment here. Uh, Sin Doyle said, that's life. Life goes on. Say la vie. So it goes. Right. And for, for me, when I, when I read that every time he said after death, it was almost to me like the, the author was uh, almost like softening the blow of the, of the death and it, almost in the tra, tra, Trafamadorian <laughs> idea that death is only one aspect of a person's state. And then when a Trafamadorian sees someone that's dead, they're just saying, oh, that person is just not doing very well at that point, moment. But there's other moments in time where they're doing just fine. And so... The, even though a death has happened in the story and so it goes, it's almost like a reminder that yes, that they've died, but they haven't really because they're still existing. If we look at it you know, the way the aliens look at it, it's just mm-hmm. sort of a reminder of that too. Yeah. What, what's that saying? We die three times or is it die twice? There's the, you die physically, you die the last time someone says, says your name and you die again the last time someone thinks about you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He also said, so it goes a couple times about uh, non-human things, though, doesn't he? It was like once was, I thought it was like a tree or... Yeah, or, there's a few times uh, with animals, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, like all the lice and stuff that died in the clothes when they put poison gas through them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah, which was kind of neat and kind of... I had to kind of glance back and be like, who is he talking? Who is he saying? So it goes about, oh, nice. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was also, yeah, you're right. It was almost like a little sort of like signpost that they, they, a death has happened. Yeah. yeah. And I think I can't remember what it was now, but I think he did it at one point with an inanimate object too, or a concept. Yeah. And, just, and it was all, it was like a joke. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, that's one of the things. Everything's about, dying. Yeah. yeah. It's one of the things about Vonnegut in general. He's got a real dark sense of humor, Mm -hmm. which can be fairly subtle or odd at times. (laughs) Well, and he comes across to as being very quotable, almost Mm -hmm. uh, more so than his novels. And it almost reminds me a little bit of like a, uh, like a post-war Oscar Wilde or something where you can just imagine him like being at, uh, you know, a, a fancy party in the 60s in the corner, you know, spouting off these, you know, uh, short little quotes and everyone uh, smiling and nodding. And there's even a, there's a Twitter I'm not sure if it's a, a bot or if it actually is 
run by people. And it's just, the, I think it's just Kurt Vonnegut. That's his name, at Kurt Vonnegut. And it's just a series of quotations from him. And it, it, they're, they're delightful because they're one or two sentences and some of them are taken out of novels, out of context. Yeah. Some are taken from his nonfiction writing and they're just these little nuggets of, like, yeah, there's the dark humor to them. There's a little bit of uh, insight. Uh, it's really, yeah, they're interesting. You're talking about parties. Uh, mm-hmm. Reminds me of that scene uh, with Kilgore Trout, because I've also read that Kilgore Trout is kind of another stand-in for Vonnegut uh, throughout his writing. But there's that scene uh, where he's talking to the woman and uh, telling her a story just off the top of his head. And she's like, is it true? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, of course it's true. <laughs> it has to be true. Otherwise, I'd get in trouble. <laughs> it's well, like if a book is in the nonfiction <laughs> section, then it's, it has to be real. That's what um, I thought as a child. Yeah. So, uh, uh, speaking of that, I have to tell you about this great book I just found called uh, "A Guide to the Dumb Birds of North America." <laughs> <laughs> and it's fantastic. It's a it's a bunch. It's it's written like as a joke, but it actually takes like it's really well done. And <laughs> and but it it renames all these birds, gives them insulting names, <laughs> and just says really insulting things about them. Uh, <laughs> but it's, what I love about it is it's shelved in the in the five ninety eight. <laughs> so it's right there, right next to the Pearson Guide, right next to National Geographic. I urge uh, this is not my book recommendation, but it's like a it's like a just a little extra aside. Uh, you will enjoy it. <laughs> Dumb birds of North America. Awesome. Yeah. And speaking of Kilgore Trout, I don't know if you guys know this, but in 1975, a book titled Venus on the Half Shell by Kilgore Trout was published. Ooh. And for the longest time, people figured it must have been Vonnegut. Yeah. But it turns out it was Jose Philip Jose Farmer. Oh. And there are varying stories about whether Vonnegut knew about it or not. <laughs> and uh, there was a story about him being very upset afterwards and yelling at someone's agent over the phone about how he could do this and or something like that. Well, wasn't Kilgore Trout like the character based on a different sci-fi, like an actual sci-fi author that Vonnegut knew? I read that Theodore too. Theodore Sturgeon. Yeah. 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 Oh, because yeah. it's Trout and Sturgeon. Yeah. Trout and Sturgeon, <laughs> yeah. So there's just all kinds of little things like that in a lot of Vonnegut's work. Yeah, which makes me wonder where what what the Billy is in the Billy Pilgrim name, because I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure there's some meaning there that I don't... Yeah, I didn't read enough to f- find out. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, his a lot of his novels are him working through his personal issues, right? Like this mm-hmm. one is trying to deal with the trauma of uh, of surviving Dresden and and all the stuff that went along with that. I mentioned in his biography that his son had had a uh, bipolar episode, and that he worked through in uh, Breakfast of Champions. And he was, and he's quite forthright about it. It's like this happened to my son. There were chemicals in his brain. The chemicals did bad things, and then he just goes on with that. And you could see him trying to find a way to accept all of this. And so I kind of feel like every Vonnegut book, there are so many pieces of him all the way through it. No, yeah, I, I think so. And it's interesting that he maybe wears that on his sleeve more than other writers do. But I think that's a common theme in writing is is a lot of writers are are dealing with things in their life and working through it in in their writing. Yeah, a form of therapy where you make money if you're successful. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. You can win the, win the lottery. Yeah, I read a quotation about him saying that the only person in the world that benefited from the bombing of Dresden was him because he wrote the book and he, he <laughs> right. got rich off of it. Yeah. And he said, like, uh, you know, he, he said something like, he got two or three dollars for every person killed. He says, yeah. a hell of a business I'm in or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that bothered him a, yeah. a lot. Like yeah. the mm-hmm. fame in general, I think really, really got to him as well. I, I can't let go through the podcast without mentioning, have you guys seen Back to School? The movie with uh, Rodney Dangerfield? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And a very, very young Robert Downey mm-hmm. Jr. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The story is Rodney Dangerfield's character is a successful businessman, but he has to go back to school because he never graduated college or something <laughs> like that. And, of course, he's lazy and, and uh, uncouth and, and always throwing parties. And he's having an affair with his teacher in this one class. But he's supposed to write a paper, right? So, And he's got a roommate. And this one point you see uh, Dangerfield smuggling in someone into the room. And then just before he gets to this door and closes around, he turns around and it's Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> And then later on, uh, Rodney Dangerfield is having an argument with his uh, girlfriend slash teacher, and she's saying, and whoever you got to write this paper about Kurt Vonnegut knows nothing about (laughs) Kurt Vonnegut. (laughs) And then later on in the movie, there's another scene where Dangerfield's on the phone, and he's going, and listen, Vonnegut, I'm canceling that check. (laughs) (laughs) I just thought that that perfectly fit in with what what I feel of 
Vonnegut's yeah. humor from his books. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just um, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> Uh, so one of the other things about Slaughterhouse Five that we asked uh, about that got a lot of response on Instagram was that it has been banned and challenged numerous times for profanity, dis- depictions of sex, and perceived heresy. Do you have a favorite banned or censored book? Uh, and so we got some. Christina said A Clockwork Orange. Mind Landscape Two Hundred Four uh, said Catcher in the Rye, which we we also briefly mentioned earlier. Jay Drossett said the Satanic Verses was interesting, and Charlie Nellum said To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if everyone has their own favorite band and challenged books around the table. Well, for sure. Um, I had To Kill a Mockingbird. It's like one of those books I reread. I also have uh, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and I also have the Harry Potter series by J.K. Rowling because it is actually challenged quite frequently for its depictions of magic and spells and various problematic things like that. I was looking at sort of recent banned or challenged books from the uh, ALA, and I was happy to see that two of the books that we've featured on this <laughs> podcast were made hey. the list regularly. One was Fun Home. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, really? yeah. Yeah, it's a for violence, interestingly, and LGBTQ content. Mm. Uh, and also Elner and Park. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rainbow Rolls, uh, mm-hmm. just for uh, suggestive themes. Oh, geez. So mm-hmm. that's, that's one of the fun things I find or interesting things about when books are banned or challenges, the reasons behind it, like, yeah. because it almost mm-hmm. is a reflection of the, the time that it's banned. Like something mm-hmm. that was challenged 50 years ago might not be now or vice versa. And like I was looking into uh, Slaughterhouse Five and one of the one of the things that w- was mentioned as part of its ban, like like Alan mentioned, was the violence, offensive content, but also the use of the word "magic fingers." <laughs> uh, uh, someone found so offensive, and that, and that was that you know that vibrating device that was attached to, to bed. his bed, yeah. Yeah. And, and he called it. So I don't know. I'm not sure what that. that that's what, a brand name. Yeah, I don't know why that put, made some, someone, but someone just did not like the fact that. I think that it was, says more about the person well, who exactly. wanted the ban- the banning. Yeah. Sometimes another interesting just. I know is that you mentioned Harry Potter and, and then another mm-hmm. one that's frequently banned is the Hunger Games series. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons is, is I always say it is it's religious viewpoint, but it doesn't actually mention religion <laughs> in the book. So again, you take a, it's just maybe a more reflection on the person that's challenging it. Yeah. Uh, and also could say maybe it's people that are challenging it. How, how many of them have actually read yeah. the stuff that they're challenging too? Yeah. Crazy. Anyway. I don't know how I feel about banned and challenged books. It's, it's always a tough, tough thing like i always want to think about it on on a i don't know a deeper level because it's a lot of banned and tel- challenged books are books that i would read anyway and enjoy and and sometimes i wonder if that's not the point of it um because you want people to read those books but you want people to read those books who don't want to read those books so it makes me wonder about books that I might not like reading and would I defend those books as much as I would defend the books that other people ban and challenge. And and that's mm-hmm. often what I think about when I think about banned and challenged books. Yeah. You get into all kinds of issues of personal taste and the philosophy of how people choose what to read or what ideas to be exposed to. A lot of times the reason behind a challenge book happens to be in the context of like a school library where mm-hmm. it would be a parent saying, well, it's not age appropriate or that kind of thing. But right. at the same time, like the librarian is saying, that's not our job to censor. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. if, if a parent doesn't want a child to read a thing, then yeah, that's a parent's job to parent. But we are not in the business of not, you know. Of raising your kids. Right. It's there. If someone wants to read it, yep. yes. Give them what they want. Yep. I'll tell you, my, my favorite band book story was there was a children's book called, I think it was When Ta- and Tacky Makes Three. Oh, yeah, and Tango. And Tango, and Tango yeah. Makes yeah, Three. Yeah. And it was about two male penguins who hatched an egg in a zoo and, and raised the baby penguin together. And of course, yep. it was banned because people thought it was pro-homosexuality. But it was based on an actual situation where two male penguins in a zoo. Yes, but you can't talk about that. Uh, yeah, but it, it, it's just... Because <laughs> people will try happened. to be like the penguins. <laughs> yeah. Like, what? And that always struck me as really startling because they're, you know, they're penguins. The kids aren't reading that and thinking, oh, I should be gay. It's, it's huh. they're, they're penguins. They're reading a cute story about penguins raising a baby penguin. Yep. Yeah. That made me think, I'm just trying to see if I had it on my list here. Oh, yeah. Another one that's challenged a lot is one that's by David Levithan called Two Boys Kissing. Hmm. And it's uh, the reason it's given is homosexuality. I'm like, well, you didn't even have to get past the title. <laughs> 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 no, nope, you know. Not throw it yeah. out. <laughs> 
Has anyone read that to confirm? Is it about two no, boys kissing? No, or are we well, just I judging mean, the book by its cover here? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. It could be literally yeah. like instead of a banned book, it's a banned title or <laughs> yeah. a title. Well, and then in the States, the Book of Negroes couldn't be called the Book of Negroes. Right. So it was, it was called, called something like all, someone, someone calls my name, knows my or name. No name right, or, right. Yeah. And we still get people to this day uh, who come to the information desk asking for that other Lawrence Hill book. Yes. And they do not believe you when you say it's the same book. It just yes. happens to have a different title. And and then they, they wait until you're not on the desk and they ask another person, another person. and they get yeah. the same answer. And then they think we're making it up and they go away mad. I also people, get that? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I just wanted like another funny thing where people would get mad at me when Downton Abbey came on TV and people would come in wanting the real, the, the book that Downton Abbey was based on. Right. And I like, they wouldn't believe me when I said, there's no book. It's not, it's not based on a book. The castle that's used in it inspired a castle in a different book, <laughs> I think by Jane Austen. <laughs> But yeah, people were like, they were sure I didn't know what I was talking about. No, Downton Abbey was based on a book. It's like, no. Yeah. I was I was based on title changes. I was just wondering mm. if everyone, anyone has ever coming in uh, asking for the Harry Potter, the first Harry Potter book a couple a couple oh. times. I want the Magician Stone and the Philosopher's oh. Oh, yeah. Stone. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. Hello, I'm David Elias, author of Elizabeth of Bohemia, a novel about Elizabeth Stewart, the Winter Queen. And you're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast. But speaking of other books, I think it's time for uh, our most awkwardly worded segment. Can you tell me a book you would also like? Erica, do you want to go first? I kind of like to go first sometimes, but I busted out the thing, the criteria again. So first, I'm going to give a shout out to a TV show. It's called The Good Place. I just watched season three at the same time as reading this book. And they sort of overlapped in my brain because it was also dealing with jumps around in time and reality and uh, free will and morality and how people keep going by focusing on each other and focusing on what good they can find, even when like crazy things are going on. But I also want to point out when I was looking for a read alike, there's no real real like for Slaughterhouse Wife. So, but if you, another book that you might like, a novelist, which is one of the databases the library subscribes to, recommended The Sparrow by Mary Doria Russell, which I was surprised at because I've read it. And to me, they don't really uh, match up. But novelist says the reasons that it recommended The Sparrow, it's because it's also haunting, stylistically complex and unconventional and has the genres science fiction classics and social science fiction. I recommend The Sparrow as as an amazing book. I don't really see the link between it and Slaughterhouse-Five, but the reason I'm mentioning it is because I happen to also just finished uh, Mary Doria Russell's new book called The Women of the Copper Country, which is actually a historical fiction about a really long and doomed from the start uh, strike of copper miners in Michigan in 1913. So just before our general strike here in Winnipeg um, and focusing a lot on the women and children who started it mainly because they were so fed up with constantly burying their brothers and fathers and sons and husbands. It was so good. So I highly recommend uh, Mary Doria Russell if you either want to start with The Sparrow or with The Women of the Copper Country. Very nice. I'm going to jump in before Dennis because I'm worried that this is the same one. <laughs> You're going to steal my book. I, 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 well, my recommendation is Sirens of Titan. You uh, stole my book. Oh. <laughs> oh. It happens. Sorry. You know what? I'll let Dennis. No, 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 I, no I, I, I'll let. I, I just I've thought got, of an alternative. I've, oh, I've, cool. got a, I've got another one. I've got another one. Okay. Um, based off Dennis, uh, he talked about depictions of mental illness in books. And I'm going to recommend I Never Promised You a Rose Garden by Joanne Greenberg, which is about someone who spends a lot of their life in their own head, in their own imagined fantasy universe, and does a really good depiction about how this person went and and sought mental help and how this helped them be able to deal with that and and lead a functional, normal life. And I would also like to recommend uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, the movie, which we have in the catalog at WPL, which I have never seen. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. So you can place your holds on that as well. That's risky to recommend something you've never seen. What if it's terrible? It could be. It could be. But I'm willing to take that risk. <laughs> I, I will say this one thing about movies based on Vonnegut books. The best movie I've seen based on a Vonnegut book was Mother Night. And it was interesting because that was one of my least favorite books of his. <laughs> but it translated really well into a movie and the performances were amazing. 
So I'll go next then, uh, since Alan already revealed, uh, <laughs> Sirens of Titan is uh, my favorite Vonnegut book. And if you like Vonnegut, there really is no one else who's like Vonnegut. But I'll add a second one, because uh, if you need an antidote to all the depression of Vonnegut's writings, which is possible, The Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker is a nonfiction work that was written basically to alleviate the fears of people who are always thinking, you know, oh, it's gotten so bad these days, everything is getting worse all the time. Steven Pinker collects data and research and information that shows that over the course of human history, things are actually generally getting better for most people most of the time, and that it's not as bad as it seems even when we're inundated with lots and lots of bad news. I found it really helpful at various points in helping me raise my mood when I was feeling really down about the world around me. So The Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker or anything by Kurt Vonnegut. I'll mm. second the the Better Angels of Our Nature. That's a super, super good book. Big, big thick. read, very thick read, but very, very, very uplifting. I mean, um, there's lots of good stuff. Yeah, That's exactly. nice. I like a big, thick book about good stuff. That's nice. Well, I'm recommending a book that's not big. It's the opposite <laughs> of big. It's actually a novella. So I don't mm. even know. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, stretching the bounds of what is considered acceptable for another book that I can recommend. But I know mm-hmm. we are kind of broadening the uh, definition. Yeah, so. we've thrown out of that. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, when I was reading Slaughterhouse Five the second time, one of the things that kept sticking with me was the Trafalgarian uh, language and how it was nonlinear and everyone could you know could see it and, and free will. So my pick is a novella by uh, Ted Chang called "The Story of Your Life." It's available in a couple places at WPL. It's uh, in a, a collection of Ted Chang stories called "Stories of Your Life and Others." It's also available in a science fiction compilation called Not One of Us, Stories of Aliens on Earth. And it's the idea of a linguist who is called in when an aliens come to Earth and they need to find a way to communicate with them. They don't understand their language. And she's brought in and begins to realize that the way that they talk, the way that they communicate is completely revolutionarily different from what humans talk. And they actually are able to teach her how to think and reorder her the way she sees life. And if this sounds familiar, it's mm-hmm. because it yep. is the basis for a movie called Arrival that came out a few years ago. Sorry, uh, Amy Adams, directed by Canadian Denny Villeneuve. So if you've enjoyed that movie, I won't say much. It's hard to talk about the plot without being spoilery. So I'll just say, uh, if you are interested in what I've said so far, I would seek out either The Story of Your Life by Ted Chang or the film Arrival. Uh, starring Amy Adams. I love Amy Adams, like one of my favorite actors. <laughs> yeah, she's good. She's right up there with uh, Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Taylor Swift wasn't in it. We uh, haven't brought Taylor Swift was... up in a while. So yeah, it's good. No, Taylor Swift is back I mean, on the Valentine's podcast. Valentine's Day, classic, classic film. <laughs> All right, now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, the part of the show where our hosts boil down their most prevalent thoughts of the past month into one word. Anyone want to go first for this one? I will. So mine actually came from The Good Place. It's Pandemonium. Um, I think I, I'll have to go back and check because I think they attributed it to Dante. And I don't know if it is. That's not what, what I found. But it, it never struck me that it's pan, like it's like pan demon. It's all the demons. It's a pandemonium. So the definition is a wild uproar because of anger or excitement or a chaotic situation. Capitalized, it refers to the capital of hell in Milton's Paradise Lost. Or uh, one of the infernal regions, hell. So I think that's maybe where the, the Dante think. And it first, uh, the first known use of pandemonium is in the second sense, is the, as the capital of hell in Paradise Lost, from 1667. So pandemonium, pandemon, yum, hmm. pandemonium. It's a good word. I like it. Trevor, you look like you're raring and ready to I'm, go. I'm ready to go. This, uh, this last month in particular, I, I, if I could pick one word, it's mutant. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, uh, the scientific definition is an organism or a new genetic character arising or resulting from an instance of mutation. And mutation is generally an alteration of the DNA sequence in the genome or chromosome of an organism. So that's sort of the scientific background. But interestingly, before the term mutants was sort of used, uh, the uh, scientists used the term sports Hmm. uh, or even spurts. So if you were called a sport, you were a mutant. But yeah. that I have two instances of mutants in the past month that have been on my mind. Turtles. <laughs> no, but close. Uh, Marvel Comics. Yeah. 
They've mm-hmm. used mutation as a shorthand explanation for superpowers since the 1950s. Mm-hmm. And about the last month or so, I've been doing a deep dive into the New Mutants series from the early 1980s. Mm-hmm. And I just want to give a little shout out to our one of our collections librarians, Barb, uh, mm-hmm. who is right on top of, uh, you know, she's got her finger on the pulse <laughs> of all the new graphic novels. There's a new series of graphic novels from Marvel called Epic Collections. Uh, and what these are, they're beautiful. They are full color reprints of classic storylines from Marvel. So, so far, WPL has uh, volumes for the Incredible Hulk, Captain America, Miss Marvel. And what they do is it's great because they don't just reprint a sequential run of one title, but they follow a storyline in whatever titles it may appear. So for example, Mm -hmm. volume one of the New Mutants begins with a Marvel team-up issue, which is Spider-Man and and it introduces us to a character that will eventually join the New Mutants. Then we get the New Mutants graphic novel, which is the official introduction to these characters. And then you get the first three issues of the regular series, followed by X-Men 167, because the story crosses <laughs> over there, then back to the New Mutants, et cetera, et cetera. So it makes it really easy to read the full story, and, and you can just follow along. You, you, it, the Epic Collections does the work for you. And I just want to make a particular note, beginning in issue 18 of the New Mutants, Bill Sankowitz takes over the uh, artistic duties from Sal Buscema. He had, and at the time, he had a very unconventional style. He was using a lot of like oil painting, collage, photorealism, uh, a line of cuts in his art. So, and so what's really cool is that the, the writer didn't change. The writer, Chris Claremont, stayed the same throughout the entire run. But it, it, even so, even though this, the writing hasn't changed, the, the feel of the book changes dramatically, issue 18 onward. So that's one instance of Mutant. The second one I just want to quickly plug <laughs> is the new Stephen King novel I'm reading called The Institute, which is amazing because it's about a group of kids with enhanced abilities, a.k.a. mutants, although Stephen King doesn't call it that. They're rounded up by a shadowy organization and subjected to testing in a place called the Institute. And I'm only partway through it, so I don't know where it's going, but it feels like it might reference Firestarter because it has a very similar idea of the, of the shop from 1980, but we'll see. It's vintage Stephen King. And what's cool about it is it feels like he was influenced by the Netflix series Stranger Things, which I know Stephen King is a huge fan of. And the creators of Stranger Things have cited Stephen King as a huge <laughs> inspiration for them. So this is a little bit like Trafalmadorian uh, thinking where which yeah. came first, you know? Uh, it's, uh, it's like it's a feedback anyway. loop. It's a big yeah. loop. So yeah. mutant for me. Thank you, everybody. Mutant. We, I, I like the uh, the art style switch. It was like almost like the story mutated with, with the Whoa. art style. <laughs> well, and I also, you just put in two more books or more books for people to read. I, mm. I think I've recommended word. about five books this episode. <laughs> I sneaked a couple more in. So. And you have to read them all before next month, listeners. <laughs> it's your uh, homework. For my nerd word, I thought we'd shift back in time to last month's book, uh, Where'd You Go, Bernadette? Uh, Specifically, the part where she's in Antarctica and uh, the physicist explains to Bernadette the concept of a quilted universe. Mm. Uh, So my nerd words are the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It's a quantum physics principle in which the more precisely the position of a particle is determined, the less precisely its momentum can be known or vice versa. And the uncertainty principle can be seen when you fire a single photon at a partially silvered mirror. Sometimes the photon will go through the mirror and sometimes the photon will bounce off the mirror, but you can't ever know which way the photon will go ahead of time. So, interestingly, Hugh Everett III, who's the father of Mark Oliver Everett, which you may know from the alternative band The Eels, was the first person to use this principle to propose the many worlds uh, interpretation of quantum physics. And a subset of this theory is the quilted universe. And in the quilted universe, when a quantum particle has the potential to be in different positions, it is actually in both positions, but in different universes. So going back to our experiment, when you launch a photon towards a partially silvered mirror, according to the quilted universe, the photon goes through the mirror and bounces off the mirror in different universes. And there's an app that you can get out there where you can it's tied to a photon launcher so before you make a decision that you want both outcomes to happen you can send a photon to the mirror saying that in one universe you'll do one way and in the other universe you'll do it the other way and it'll tell you which universe you're in so you perform that action and you can safely know that somewhere in another universe you're doing the alternative action yeah or you could flip a coin not the same (laughs) (laughs) kind of the same uh, my nerd word for today is sleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Sleep is defined as a condition of body and mind such as that which typically occurs for several hours every night in which the nervous system is relatively inactive, the eyes closed, the postural muscles relaxed, and consciousness practically suspended. That doesn't really tell you what sleep is. Mm -hmm. And as far as I've been able to determine from reading, no one actually knows why we have to sleep. Mm -mm. But every living creature does. And neurologists just really can't tell you absolutely why you can't not sleep. However, I can't sleep terribly well. So that's why it's been on my mind. Mm -hmm. And that's about as deep as that goes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I like both your last two words were kind of about how the more we find out, the less stable things seem, the less explainable they seem, which is very Vonnegut. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, we have to sign off for this month. So it goes. Thank you so much, dear readers, for tuning into this, the XXII episode of the Time to Read podcast. Uh, in November, join us as we read The Remains of the Day by Kazu Ishiguru. Get in on the conversation by finding us on Facebook or emailing us at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. We'd love it if you hit subscribe in your iTunes or your favorite podcast service. We'd love it even more if you were to give us a five-star rating. And until until next time, make sure you find Time to Read. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Time to Read podcast. We were talking about Slaughterhouse 5 by Kurt Vonnegut. Time to Read is a production of the Winnipeg Public Library. Our panel today included Alan Chorney, Dennis Penner, Erica Ball, and Trevor Lockhart. Kirsten will return in a future episode. Our webmaster is Aaron Seaburn. Our social media guru is Regan Brew. Audio production and music by Dennis Penner. Some of the comments from this episode came from GMC Davis, Sin Doyle, Christina, Mind Landscape 204, Jay Drossett, and Charlie Nellum. You can be a part of our show too. Email us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca with suggestions for books that you'd like us to read and discuss, and comments and questions about the book we're reading for our next show. Visit us on the web at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. Check out our show notes with links to some of the things we talked about today, and take part in a discussion about the books we're reading. You can also join our Facebook group. Next month, we're reading The Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro. We're looking forward to hearing what you think about it. Was I Never Promised You a Rose Garden by... Oh, boy. Now I'm going to have to look it up. Look up the author. Um, Just take a break. That would be so seamless. We won't even know. We won't even know. <laughs> no, I'm going to leave this awkward silence in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the it happens. Alan is currently scrolling through his phone. Joanne Greenberg. <laughs>